Good morning, beloved. Welcome to Christ Church. Uh, it's Pastor Ryan here. I'm excited to welcome you to join us today uh, in the way of Jesus. And Jackie, of course, is finally back with me. <laughs> I convinced her to be yeah. here today. We missed you so much. It's so hard not being together, just even over the season of Christmas. I just think I miss you all the more. It's so hard not to hug you and be with you, but this is what we have and we're just gonna enjoy it to the best of our ability and so welcome welcome to our home welcome to church today and we really look forward to setting apart this time mm -hmm. to worship and come to jesus and let the rest of the stuff just fade away and just sit in our created purpose of worshiping and reflecting on him yeah last week um, i filmed my sermon in church and put it all together and a friend of mine texted me and said, have you seen the news today? And the all the information of um, mm. the insurrection in the States was happening. And it's a difficult time. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like there's always something new happening on the news. Right. And that we're never, we can never be ahead of it. We can never address everything. Um, we can never make sense of everything. And... And so it's been difficult, but I think it it highlights the importance of the movement that we go through on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. The beginning with the Collect for Purity is to purify our hearts and minds and refocus them on Jesus mm -hmm. alone. And um, it can get, so what we're trying to do is we're bringing all of these issues and we're going, once Jesus can make sense of these issues, right. then I'll enjoy Jesus. And it just puts everything backwards. Yeah. The cart before the horse, so to speak. So what we want to do this morning is we want to give priority mm -hmm. to Jesus, focus upon him and his goodness and his sufficiency. And so to begin that, we will pray this prayer together mm -hmm. to submit our hearts and say, Jesus, Recenter me, uh, wash the world from me, and help me find uh, you and find my true self in you and find how I will seek to exist in this world in you. Okay? So let's pray the Collect for Purity together as we move towards worship. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. And so Jesus, we receive now your purifying Holy Spirit. We breathe him in deeply. Fill and search our hearts. Cleanse us from the darkness and anxieties of this world. Come into our minds. Clarify them, quiet them, and focus them upon Jesus. Come into our souls, our emotions, and bring comfort and peace to them with your presence. Come into our bodies in any way in which they ail, carry stress, are tense, ready to fight or flee. Calm them now. Bring release to them. And focus us upon the face of Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And as we turn our hearts to him in worship, draw us out of the bleakness of this life and into the glory of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. All 
throughout my history Your faithfulness has walked beside me Winter storms make way for spring And every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life All over my life me remember when I'm weak fear may come with fear will leave you lead my heart to victory you are my strength and you always will be I see the evidence Psalm 63. In this psalm, David in a time of crisis in his life expresses his deep desire and his devotion to be in the presence of the Lord. O God, you are my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. 
So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed, and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king, king shall, shall rejoice, rejoice in God. God. All, All who swear by, by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. This is our story, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. The great I preach whose name is love. Whoever lives and pleads for me, my name is graven on his hands. My name is written. Heart, I know that while in him he stands, no tongue can bid me dance to him. Part, no tongue can bid me dance to him. Satan tempts me to despair. Tells me of the guilt within A word I look and see in there Who made an end to all my sin Because a sinless Savior died My sinful soul is counted free For God the just is satisfied Look on him and pardon me. Look on him and pardon me. Behold him there, the risen lamb. My perfect spot is righteousness, the great unchangeable. I am the King of glory and of grace. One in Himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by His blood. My life is hid with Christ on high. With Christ, my Savior, and I got. With Christ, my Savior. My name is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. I know that while in heaven he stands, no tongue can bid me this deep heart. No tongue can bid me Because a sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God, the just is satisfied to look on Him and pardon me. To look on Him and pardon me. 
bought and paid for by the precious blood of Jesus. All my sin is rolled away. I am made holy in your blood. I am made holy in the precious blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Sing, no oh, precious is the flow Nothing but the blood of Jesus And you are here Moving in our midst I worship you I worship you You are here Working in this place I worship you, I worship you, sing it again, you are here, you are here, moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, working in this place, I worship you. Worship you, you are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Of my God, that is who you are. You are. We make a miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. Of my God, that is who you are. You are here, touching every heart. I worship you. I worship you. You are here, healing every heart. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. You are here, turning lives around. I worship you, I worship you, you are here, mending every heart, I worship you, Lord, I worship you, see how you are, way make miracle work, promise keep a light, darkness, my God, that is who you are. Stop working, you never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. No, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never
never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, that is who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are, Lord. It's who you are. You are a way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. prayer, uh, the collect for the week together. Um, if you're with someone in your home, maybe you can hold hands. Mm -hmm. okay, just that closeness and unity mm -hmm. and coming to Christ together today. Um, just feel a strong need for that comfort of touch um, and that, that togetherness. Mm -hmm. So let's pray this prayer together. Know that our hearts are with you as we pray. Almighty God, whose Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, is the light of the world. Grant that your people, illumined by your word and sacraments, may shine with the radiance of Christ's glory, that he may be known, worshipped, and obeyed to the ends of the earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Gospel reading this morning is from the Gospel of St. Matthew in chapter 4, beginning in verse 12. Now when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, 
And leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light, and for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Well, I'm going to pick up this morning where we left off last week in our studies of the Gospel of Matthew. So we have come to chapter 4 now, and Jesus is beginning his ministry. And in doing so, he has moved from the town or city of Nazareth to the city of Capernaum. And while all of this is happening, John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, uh, born of his mother Elizabeth, um, is has been arrested by King Herod. And so Jesus kind of takes this as a signal, actually, to move, uh, to withdraw into the region of Galilee, kind of away from these political issues, surprisingly, um, at the time in order to establish his ministry. And the church fathers actually have a lot of great stuff to say about Jesus' strategic withdrawal is that he is not looking at this point to take on Herod in his teaching, but is instead seeking to cultivate a following that is going to embody his teaching. And so that's what we see here is Jesus moves to Capernaum. And then it says this, that in verse 17, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so Jesus, though strategically withdrawing from um, into Galilee from Nazareth, takes up and continues on the message of John the Baptist. And so that's what I want to look at a bit here today is that now the message of John, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, is very popular and well received amongst the average person. They are desperate for change. So when John comes, a voice in the wilderness crying, make a way, prepare the way for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, calling people to repentance, to leave their ways that they're currently seeking to live and the ideology, ideologies that they are seeking to follow and the philosophies that they bought into and their political hopes and allegiances, the average person is keen to respond to that message because all of those philosophies, ideologies, and political allegiances don't actually really functionally benefit them. <laughs> and you might feel that. You might be a average blue collar, white collar person out there. And you find all of this political noise that's going on in the world doesn't actually benefit me very much. It doesn't serve my everyday needs. So when a prophet comes proclaiming on behalf of God that a new way is at hand, is coming, it calls to something within us to go, I'm in because I'm sick of these systems. I'm worn out and exhausted. The flip side though of this message is John is very unpopular, especially amongst those who hold political power, because John is calling for a compromise to the systems that everyone has been functioning in and saying these systems are systems of the world. And you need to leave them to get ready for a new way of heaven. And for those who have negotiated places and power and offices, you know, like the religious leaders, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they've negotiated a power with King Herod. 
And so John's upending of that system is a threat to their power. So when John gets arrested, it's actually some good news for those religious leaders, though publicly they might say, oh, what a sad loss for us. John was such a great preacher. You know, John had a a message we all need to respond to, but very political in their responses. Now, what we know is that ultimately John's arrest leads to his beheading, sadly, because what John had done is he was the only one willing to call out King Herod for his hypocrisy. King Herod was ruthless as a leader. And he got exactly what he wanted, and everyone was a potential threat to his power. He killed family members and exiled sons. And, you know, he did all sorts of atrocities. We see in Matthew um, that he killed all of the uh, the sons of of uh, Bethlehem. And so, all of these types of atrocities, though. Nobody, especially the religious leaders, weren't calling him out publicly on his sins because if they compromised Herod's power, they lost their power. John isn't like that. John openly calls Herod to repentance, especially for his shady marriage that he has with his brother's wife and all the stuff that's going on. And what we learn later is that part of what motivates King Herod to behead John is a lust that he has for his own niece. And so all of these elements point to the corruption that's at work in the political and power system of the time. So John is like a lone voice in the wilderness saying, this way sucks. (laughs) Stop, turn from it and get ready for the kingdom of heaven. So for Jesus to continue using this message to launch his mystery is actually, or sorry, his ministry is a great example of the continuity between the old covenant and the new covenant that Jesus is going to bring. He refers to John the Baptist as the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. And so let's look at that message. The old covenant is is come to a close now. And Jesus is going to bring that to fruition and fulfillment. John is that last crowning cry. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So Jesus in carrying that on is actually going to bring it to an even greater fulfillment. So let's break down the message a bit and look at it. Repent for The kingdom of heaven is at hand. I find this is helpful work with the scriptures often. Slow everything down, take it one word at a time, and eat it. So repent. The language here is to turn. It's a change of mind, an intentional choice to go. This is the way I've been going, the way I've been thinking, the way I do things. And I'm going to intentionally turn away from it. It's an an about face, a 180. And I'm going to turn from the ways I've been doing things. And specifically according to the message of John the Baptist here, I'm going to turn from my loyalties to specific political powers and religious systems. And I'm going to turn and make myself ready for something new. Or I'm going to return back to something I once knew. Repent for. This is an important word. comes up a lot in the Bible. For is important because it means something. It's saying because of something else. Repent because of. It's a motivating word. Because the end is near. Nope. That's not the message here. I think whenever we hear the word repent, we wrongly expect that that's the rest of the phrasing. Some guy walking around with a sandwich board on his chest and his back. Repent for the the end is near, for the end is nigh. 
That's not actually the message that John or Jesus is proclaiming. Repent, turn, because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So what is the kingdom of heaven? It's God's kingdom. And what we know in the scriptures is that God's kingdom is free of evil and sin. The same sin and evil that rose up and captured the hearts of Adam and Eve and all of humanity since has plunged our world into darkness. That same evil attempted to take over the kingdom of heaven and failed. Isn't that great news? So God's kingdom has has already defeated sin and evil. God's dwelling and God's um, realm of authority that he has in heaven is unchallenged by evil. His goodness is already triumphant. So the kingdom of heaven is ruled by God. His power is um unending and his goodness has already triumphed over evil. And the king of this kingdom is good. So God's kingdom versus the kingdoms of the world are very different. There is no corruption. There is no exploitation in his kingdom. There is no poverty in his kingdom. There is no injustice or war. His kingdom is forever established. And his government is in and of himself in his perfect loving goodness. This is the kingdom of heaven. So turn from the kingdoms of this world and the ways and the systems of this world because God's good and perfect and powerful kingdom is at hand. Now, when John the Baptist preaches this, everyone understands it as is coming. Is at hand is this language of it's on its way. And for an ancient people, the idea of a coming outside power is a very real news that you have to care about. The Babylonians are coming. The Assyrians are coming. The Romans are coming, right? This kind of language is legit. Now, in our day, we're still stuck in this like Cold War mentality, even with the Internet. The Russians are coming. The Chinese are coming. And all of these fears are constantly being stoked behind the scenes and in the news. But here's the language and the message of Jesus is not fear the Russians or fear the Chinese, or whatever part of the world and you see as a warring outside government or power that you need to fear. Instead, the message of John the Baptist is, God's kingdom is coming, and his arrival, its arrival, is imminent. And with that language, though, it comes all of these promises that God is going to fulfill in the past. Now, when Jesus Christ proclaims that same message, he's, it's a small difference. Same words, different meaning. For John the Baptist, it's coming and is eminent. For Jesus, it is is here. Is at hand means it's available. And not only is the kingdom of God here, and is available, but I am God. I am the king, and I am here. And it's an invitation to receive him and give your allegiance and trust to his power, to his way, to his government, and to his kingdom. And it doesn't actually change all of the governmental systems that are going on. It challenges it, from the inside out. It's a kingdom that resides in the heart and is at work in the world. And one day will consume all physical things into itself. There, an invisible kingdom is slowly taking over a visible world 
but it begins with the intangible, invisible parts of you and works into the rest. The invitation is, by Jesus, different than John the Baptist. John is saying, repent and get ready. Jesus is saying, repent and receive, because it's here. That's the good news that Jesus is bringing with this invitation to repentance. Leave this old way that's not actually working for you and receive from me a new good way that promises to do exactly what you need it to do most. And so it, it, it uses this language, Matthew, that Jesus begins to preach this message. And I think we can take for granted the language of preach. Because we're so familiar with it, because I do it all the time, we've grown up with it, I think we're, over, we're pretty accustomed to hearing it. But preach is not a word or action used very often in the Old Testament. We actually only find it in five verses in three books, Ezekiel, Amos, and Micah. So the prophetic books near the end of the Old Testament. And they're used not to describe the action of teaching so much as an authoritative proclamation, often with tones of judgment. So the language that gets used most often in those passages is preach against, and it's to communicate consequences for evil. Now, the reference in Micah chapter 2, verse 11, I just think is kind of funny. And it says this, if a man should go about and utter wind, and I'm not going to tell you what utter wind refers to. I'll let you do that work yourself. So if a man should go about in utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. And the picture here that God gives through Micah is that there's a predominant message of a culture. And that culture's message is, let me preach to you all the benefits of wine and strong drink. That could be said of the island a bit. <laughs> Now, Jesus, his preaching, and we're going to see in the coming chapters here, the centrality of Jesus's ministry is around his preaching. He's going to call his disciples and great crowds are going to gather to hear him. But Jesus's teaching is different than every other kind of preaching. Nothing is like his preaching. He's going to proclaim something that is good news. And that's where we get this language of gospel in the New Testament. It's Jesus is, like the Old Testament prophets, going to proclaim something, but rather than proclaim a judgment and terrible consequences, though those do exist, Jesus' predominant message is to proclaim a new way a new way of living and of being and of enjoying and of solving problems, a new way of hope for the future, a new way of building community, a new way of eternal life and restoration of the whole creation. And that way that he is going to preach is himself. Every other message and ideology and philosophy in this world, every other religion is going to tell you in their preaching, you need to do something. Everything about your life is dependent upon you and what you do. Jesus is going to come with a very different, unique message. And his message is, I, Jesus, am going to do something. I, Jesus, have done something. And this proclamation of Jesus, when we get to chapter 5, this is what we're getting ready for. And I want this sermon today to act as a precursor to chapter 5. I want to get us ready. 
every time God has spoken and taught and revealed things all throughout human history as is cataloged in the Old Testament library, the word of God is Jesus. He spoke the creation into existence. He spoke the law to Moses. He made the covenant with Abraham. He spoke to David and made covenants and promises to him. And all of that teaching and all of that self-revealing and all of that explaining that has been done throughout all of history has been Jesus. But the New Testament the early church understood that all of this activity and words of Jesus was a shadow of the full true revelation that is Jesus himself. So you have to understand the coming of Christ is the bright light to the world. And in it is the full revelation of God, the full salvation of God, the full wisdom of God, everything that needs to be known for all eternity past and all eternity future has happened in Jesus in this moment. Everything else, eternity future and eternity past is a shadow of that bright light that is birthed here at the coming of Jesus. And so when he preaches now, when we go to chapter 5, and he's preaching, it's the true light that we understood dimly in the Old Testament. And he's the true light that we will actually, for all eternity, look back upon. Have you ever noticed in the book of Revelation, as it talks about eternity with God and the restoration of the earth and the coming together of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth, all of these things happening, it's cross-centered worship. It's Jesus-centered worship that we'll spend all eternity looking back on here. If that is the case, how much more so should the now, the present, be focused on the bright light of Jesus? He should be the most captivating thing for our hearts and our souls and our minds and our beings. And so the call that I want to make today is this. Jesus is going to be preaching, to be proclaiming, to be offering, and to be giving something for us to receive the truest, best, brightest form of wisdom and understanding and the way to live and the way to function and the way to be that will make sense of all things, all darkness, all problems, everything that needs to be mended and made whole, Jesus will make clear in his preaching and his life. So I call us to a singular allegiance to Jesus. To hear the message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and to turn from the things of this world. How much news are we consuming? How much information are is flowing into our hearts and forming our understanding of truth? Jesus is the only truth. The ultimate truth, the truth that makes sense of all other truth, and the truth that judges all other lies. Jesus is the way. So I want to call us to a time of Jesus-focused consumption. And these are the priorities that I believe that Christ Church should have not only for now, but for our future in terms of the word of Jesus preached. Is that number one, we should be devoted to a life saturated by the words of Jesus. Where we live and breathe and soak in and eat the words of Jesus. This is how he describes himself, that we are to eat of him and drink of him. That was the reading this morning in the daily office. Let's find that. John chapter 6. 
I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. It's me. Eat me in my word. This is at the heart of what Jesus is about to teach us. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. This is this is the message of Jesus, is that he is everything. So we want to saturate ourselves, feast upon the word of Jesus, eating, drinking the good news proclamation of himself. So number one, we want to be a people saturated in the words of Jesus, in the preaching of Jesus. Secondly, we want to be a people satisfied in the words of Jesus, that we find our personal satisfaction there. And that means your particular needs, your particular wounds, your particular story needs to find satisfaction in Jesus. So we're saturated and we're satisfied. And then we as a people must embody that preaching of Jesus. It must work its way into the way we think, the way we act, the way we do, the way we prioritize, the way we function. We must embody the preaching of Jesus and not just say we believe it and live something different. It's a matter of integrity of the church. Do we hold to, do we live out the message we proclaim? Do we live it so saturated, satisfied, and embodied? And lastly, the preaching of Jesus must become our witness, that his words are our words, that we would love the world as he has loved us, that we would proclaim this good news in the way Jesus proclaims it. I'm challenged in this season. I'm tired of the news. I'm tired of social media. I'm tired of trying to keep up. And all it does is lead me into darkness. I want the words of Jesus. I want to feast on the good news constantly. I want to be saturated and satisfied and I want to embody it and I want to witness to it. This must be the priority of Christ church. It's the preaching of Jesus. And it begins by hearing the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is available. That's our place. That's our home. This is not it. These problems do not hold the weight and the end of our souls and hearts. North American and global politics do not hold my soul. My hope is not in these things. And Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. So I, I cannot help but feel called to a singular allegiance to the teachings and preaching of Jesus that we would take the next couple weeks to prepare our hearts to move into the Sermon on the Mount, ready to be saturated in his teaching, satisfied in his teaching, embodying his teaching, and bear witness to his teaching. This is my prayer for Christ Church Oceanside. I lament, my friends, our separation, I lament this time. This is a hard time. But this is what I signed up for. Is to be a people devoted to Jesus. And so I would ask you, prioritize the daily office. 
prioritize morning and evening prayer with me. Hear my confession that I have failed in that regard, missing all too often, especially evening prayer. Return to the word with me and let's see and feast upon the good news of Jesus together. This is my prayer. Now let's turn our hearts together to pray for the needs of our region, faithfully led by our friends, Wally and Allison Chen. Would you pray with me, please? Let us pray to our incarnate Lord, who has brought us out of darkness and into his own marvelous light. Christ born for us, Son of God given for us, help us to know you, to worship, and to serve you. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Wonderful Counselor, you order all things with your wisdom. Help the Church to reveal the mystery of your love and fill her with the Spirit of Truth. Jesus, Jesus, light light of of the the world, world, shine shine upon us. us. Mighty God, the government is on your shoulders. Guide the leaders of the nations and bring in your kingdom of justice and righteousness. Particularly at this time, we pray for peace wherever strife is present around the world. We especially pray for the nation of the United States of America and the turmoil that that festers across that country. We ask for blessings to be upon the incoming presidential administration as we pray for understanding, your peace, your healing, and your truth to be with all their citizens. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Everlasting Father, you call us to live together in unity. Protect by your mercy all your children. Bless our families and renew our communities with your guiding light. Jesus, Jesus, light light of of the the world, world, shine shine upon us. us. Prince of Peace, you bring reconciliation through the cross. By your healing power, give to all who suffer your gift of wholeness and peace. We pray for all who suffer and toil through this pandemic crisis. We lift to you all those frontline workers who devote so much of themselves. Please give them continued strength to withstand the unbelievable challenges of care that they face. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. We pray for comfort for all those families who now mourn the loss of their loved ones that have been innocently stricken by the COVID virus. We pray for those living all alone in care homes and who may pass away in loneliness. Jesus, Jesus, light light of the the world, world, shine shine your your grace and mercy down down upon us. us. We thank you, Lord, for your hand in guiding the amazing development of the COVID-19 vaccines. Help us to be patient and encouraging during the ongoing unprecedented task of vaccine distribution. Jesus, Jesus, light light of of the the world, world, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Heavenly Father, We pray for our parish and for those who are in need of particular prayer for their various afflictions, in mind or in body. We pray that Christ Church Oceanside can grow in your light and lovingly lead others from darkness to that brighter awakening. Jesus, Jesus, light light of of the the world, world, shine shine upon upon us. us. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, full of the Spirit, Hear Hear our our prayer, prayer, receive receive our our praises, fill our lives. Amen.
My hope is built on nothing less Than Jesus' blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame But only trust in Jesus' name Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak and made strong, and the Savior's love through the storm. He is the Lord, He is Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within God, which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen.